Hi, everyone. Hi, hi. Second last speaker of the day. How are you traveling? Okay. Um, so it's kind of, I was expecting to see Leslie in her pajamas, giving us a blow-by-blow -blow account of all the, the details from behind the scenes in Paris. Lucky I've got my spies there and I'm going to share some of their text messages and emails that I've been getting. Some may be true, Miss. some may be not so true. So I'm going to just talk to you about pre-Paris. That actually could take a long time, but I'll make it short. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about what's been happening in Paris, um, give you a little synopsis, and post-Paris, will there be light from the City of Light? So, um, my area of research, I probably best describe myself as an ethnoecologist. Uh, so, I'm really interested in the relationship between people and the environment, particularly from an anthropocentric perspective. So, I was thinking when I was listening to everybody speak, maybe I'm an anthropocentricologist. Maybe I can call myself that. Is there such a thing? We're all an ologist of some kind. So I guess from my perspective, um, really we need to be talking about climate change as a social problem, more than an environmental problem. And I think some of the sessions really have been um, uh, presenting that position anyway. So of great concern uh, to me and I think all of us is that this global population of ours is increasing very rapidly. So by 2050, they're predicting that it will be uh, 9.7 billion. So that's a lot of people that we need to keep looking after, a lot of grandchildren and great-grandchildren that we need to be thinking about. Okay, so Leslie actually talked a little bit about, this is a very recent report that's come out in the Flurry pre-Paris, uh, about the weather-related disasters that, um, that have um, killed many hundreds of thousands of people. And there you see it graphed. I was actually quite surprised because a lot of the focus in our lives are on um, bushfires. So I was quite surprised when I saw this graph. So when we think about today's 2.2 um, billion children, um, we need to be thinking about what they're facing in terms of their future. Uh, what I also meant to say when we were talking about the impacts um, of climate change before is that there are extreme events. I do a lot of work in Vanuatu and I can assure you that the incremental impacts of climate change are well and truly with us. I'm seeing people who are subsistence um, farmers who are completely dependent on the climate for their crops and their livelihoods, the crops are failing, the climate's becoming unpredictable. Um, there are more vector-borne diseases. It's very prevalent in some of these very remote communities um, in Vanuatu. So uh, the very young and the unborn uh, are not responsible for what they're going to inherit. And I think that's a big part of what we're all concerned about here. They need the right to a viable environmental future. And at this stage, they don't have such a right. So, um, I think Klaus has talked and many people have talked about the importance of various um, ways of approaching climate change and dealing with climate change. I'm increasingly interested in the role of the law uh, in terms of really conserving the future. So, the, But the concept of intergenerational stewardship is not new. If you look in any of the religious texts, you will see it firmly there, including the Quran. And this concept of stewardship uh, has been tested recently in the courts in the Philippines. And don't you love the name of this case? The Dolphins versus Secretary Rees. So this is a, uh, in May this year, the concept of people being stewards of the planet was tested. So some brave lawyers went to the courts and said, we're the stewards for the dolphins. And what we want to do is fight the, the dolphin's habitat um, was threatened by a company called Japex that was going to mine the seabed in a marine protected area, and they won the case. So it was an example of where the law is starting really to move um, in terms of recognising our role as, as stewards of the environment and of nature. 
So the dolphins, those who are biologists in the room, will, it's a jagged tooth dolphin was the, the actual name of the dolphins. And I'm sure these aren't jagged tooth dolphins, but they kind of looked like they were smiling and happy that the dolphins won the case. So does anybody know what today is? Human Rights Day. Who said that? Yeah, you get the prize. Today is human... Oh, I already told you it's Human Rights Day. <laughs> So today is Human Rights Day. So what I'm going to be talking about mostly is human rights and climate change. And the reason there is... Can you see that they're naked people? Um, there are so many naked people in the Opera House. I will tell you why that's so in a minute. So this concept of uh, human rights and the environment is not a new one. As I said, in the religious texts, it's there well and truly. Um, looking after future generations is just part of what we should be doing as good people on the planet. And um, a wonderful scholar, Edith Brown Weiss, who some of you may have heard of. If you haven't, please look her up. She's incredible. She's been talking about the importance of uh, every generation having a right to receive a planet in no worse condition than that of previous generations. And to inherit comparable diversity and natural and cultural resources and to have equitable access to use to secure benefits from the planet. When we're talking about human rights and the environment, there are many references, um, including in the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which talks about um, the importance of the health of the child, including, but it's not limited to recognising the dangers and risks of environmental pollution and knowledge of the role of environmental sanitation. So, but there is no express right to a viable environmental future contained in the Convention. There is an implied right to a healthy environment. In the pre-Paris flurry, I got really bound up in this. Um, I'm a member of the Global Network for Study on Human Rights and the Environment, as is Klaus. Uh, and we drafted in great haste a declaration um, which is a draft declaration on human rights and climate change. And I can give you the link afterwards. Um, but it's a draft declaration that this collaborative group of scholars wrote in about three weeks flat, just before, just before Paris, because we could see that there was a real need for it. Um, little did we know that there were lots of other governments and bodies writing similar declarations. So there seems to be a real global groundswell in terms of recognising the need of human rights and climate change. So because I was one of the drafting um, scholars, I'm just going to focus a little bit on the one that we have um, we've put forward. And it truly was one of the most exciting um, exercises I've been involved in, that people were just wanting to share their knowledge and their goodwill. And there were no government agencies involved. Um, it truly was an exercise where we were all um, contributing our thoughts. And this draft was zooming around the world very rapidly while people were making track changes and accepting and deleting. And on, and on and on it went. So these are a couple of the, um, I'll just show you a couple of the articles. Human rights and a profound commitment to climate justice and inter inter are interdependent and in indivisible, is, one, is Article 1. And Article 2 is all human beings have the right to a secure, healthy and ecologically sound earth system and to fairness, equity and justice in the provision of climate resilience, adaptation and mitigation. Um, just before we get on to this, in, we put our draft declaration out to the world, and it's many of you hopefully have seen it by now. If not, just email me and you can, um, or go onto the site. Um, but it's been quite astounding. If you look on the site, hopefully you will, you'll see the, the scholars and the scientists and the individuals and the mothers and the children that are now endorsing this um, draft document. We're asking for in-principle endorsement only and we're asking for contributions in terms of amendments. And we've had some really, really valuable feedback, which is quite heartening. So we're expecting to have a final um, ready in about um, May next year. So pre-Paris flurry, there were documents flying everywhere, uh, including, and so I'm just giving you a quick scan of the human rights documents that, just a little snippet of some of them. 
So this is one that came from Fiji, which talked about the results like they re as, as with most of the, um, the island states, they're really lobbying very hard for 1.5 degrees. Uh, and they're saying that um, the results will be catastrophic to the enjoyment of human rights on frontline island states and indeed in vulnerable areas in Australia such as Torres Island communities. Some children in Vanuatu where I do research. Another letter, just to give you another bit of a pre-Paris survey, which came from the ACTU Alliance um, European Union and Amnesty International. And there again, they urged uh, that the Paris Agreement um, includes and really promotes the um, respect, protection, promotion, and fulfillment of human rights. Sharon Burrows, um, she talked about zero carbon, zero poverty, and that there'll be no jobs on a dead planet. So, Pre-Paris, we saw marches, protests all around the world, including uh, here in Perth. So then we get to Paris, city of light, city of love, city of hope, or maybe is it city of shoes? So when they were stopped from protesting, people put down their shoes, uh, including Ban Ki-moon and Pope Francis. Their shoes were there as a protest for climate change. Our Prime Minister ratified stage two of the Kyoto Protocol on the 1st of December. Uh, and certainly as Australians, we were very happy to hear that. 2nd of December, there was concern surrounding climate change and human rights that came out of Washington, D.C. Uh, who is urging member states um, to work to ensure any climate agreement reaches and incorporates human rights in a holistic manner. 3rd of December, this is very Australian-centric, this presentation. Um, our Envir Min Environment Min Minister, Greg Hunt, uh, launched the National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy. And that's to be backed by the federal government's one um, billion dollar, one billion dollars from foreign and aid budget, that will help Pacific nations tackle climate change. That's been very controversial. The redirection of those that funding. On the fourth of December, the Philippines Commission on Human Rights announced an investigation which would hold fossil fuel companies responsible for the impacts of climate change. This is a world first. Um, in terms of investigating uh, 50 big polluters, which are part of 90 legal entities who are responsible for the majority of global t CO2 and carbon emissions in the Earth's atmosphere. 5th of December, so we're getting close to now, um, a lawsuit was announced, a Peruvian farmer and mountain guide filed a lawsuit against a German utility company in the regional court in Germany. The reason is that the energy company's emissions are threatening his family property and his home. Glacial melting um, has created a, a significant flood risk for the, his city. This is a legal precedent uh, and it could help bring justice to vulnerable people in terms of climate change. Here he is, this is Sol. He looks like he means business, doesn't he? 8th of December, uh, the ecologist reported that there is to be an international tribunal for the rights of nature established by People's Convention in Paris. The ultimate name, aim is for the tribunal um, to become part of the international legal frameworks, such as the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Post Paris. So at the moment in the Paris Agreement, there, under Article 2, which is the purpose, the whole purpose of the agreement, human rights has been um, embedded in there. But we've gradually, over the week, we've seen the last week, we've seen a diminution and there's a question as to whether human rights will, will remain. So early, um, early in the week, 
Indigenous peoples were taken out of um, Article 2.2. So Indigenous Peoples groups are really alarmed and fighting against that. Um, so that happened. Um, then uh, yesterday, it's a shame I haven't got the text to show you. Um, yesterday, um, science was taken out of the, the purpose, which is really good. Uh, and reference to gender equality, um, I'm trying to think, the third thing was, there were three things that have now completely gone, so it's been, um, I can't tell you what the end text is going to be like, but we're really, really concerned, actually I can tell you, um, we're really concerned about what the end result will be in terms of human rights and the environment. The reason I showed you that picture of, I'll actually tell you in more detail in a minute, I've got it written here. Um, the reason I showed you that picture of all those naked bodies in the Opera House was a joke that I had with a network I've been working with, in that we try, when we wrote our draft declaration, we tried really hard to get media interest in human rights and climate change. Absolutely none. I mean, we're all scholars, so maybe we just don't know how to put the marketing pitch on it. Um, we tried, you know, 700,000 dead from earthquakes, and none of it made any difference. And so I said, what do I need to do? I'm going to take all my clothes off. I'm actually going to put the declaration on my head. I'm going to run around the Opera House. And we decided that I would probably get arrested and impinge other human rights if I did that. So um, that's why I put up the, the picture of the naked bodies in the Opera House, because um, I think it's important to be really making a stand on this. And um, I'd be really hopeful that um, those of you that are in the audience, because this is not over yet, post-Paris, we're not in post-Paris yet. Paris isn't over. Paris still has until the end of the weekend. And so we're seeing like the flurry of emails that are going around at the moment about human rights and climate change is quite extraordinary. And so I urge you to, with all your networks and all your influence, to tweet, to email, to be thinking about it, to really lobby anybody you can think of, to make sure that human rights remains in 2.2 um, of the Paris Agreement. But post-Paris, uh, will there be light? Well, I don't really hold out much hope for this agreement, but. I can see, and some of the other speakers have, have discussed the enormous effort that has gone into this, really on the periphery, I guess all the side events they call them, but the activity has been intense and the effort. So our group alone with the declaration that we're taking very seriously, it's been translated into lots of languages, we're distributing around the world, so we're really following the most um, equitable process of engagement that we can with no resources whatsoever. Um, so there are efforts like ours, multiplied, multiplied in lots of different directions. So I think you were saying like the importance of, of the, the effort and the concentration of Paris, if we kind of look a little past the actual agreement itself, I think is, is that the world is paying attention. Um, I hope that the right to an environmental future uh, remains in the consciousness of people um, and that that huge effort that's gone into really raising, raising awareness will not, be, will not be lost. So at the moment anything to do with human rights in the agreement, if you look at it right now, is in square brackets. Does everybody know what square brackets means? It means has, it's not agreed to as yet. So everything to do with human rights at the moment is in square, in square brackets. So I actually had the text for you. Um, but we really need to ensure those brackets are removed. So I'm hoping that you can really lobby your networks to do that. And that we can secure for our descendants the right to a viable environmental future. It really is absurd and negligent that we find ourselves in this position I'm the mother of seven children, grandmother of two, and I'm very interested in their futures. So um, I think that it's not too late. COP21 can still embed 
human rights front and centre of the agreement if they want to, um, and hopefully they will. So I wanted to end with a quote. This is from uh, a woman who's a professor of law, and she just wrote this this week. Climate change is emphatically more than a technical or scientific problem. It represents a profound crisis in human hierarchies, fraught with uneven distributions of vulnerability. It is therefore unsurprising that so many recent initiatives point in the direction of seeing human rights as intrinsically threatened by climate change. Indeed, it is vital that respect for human rights should now be understood as indispens an indispensable element of any adequate approach to climate change. So this is my little grandson, Owen. We've seen various grandchildren over the last few days. Um, and I just thought I'd end with this quote. It's not enough to prepare our children for the world. We must prepare our world for our children. And that's my email address. So if you want to find anything about the draft declaration on climate change, you'll find even if you go on the website, you actually contact me. So um, I'd love to hear from you if you want to learn more. Thank you. Thank you.